Today's video is relevant to both Axe users and Axe manufacturers, and it could save a lot of handles. We're going to talk about things like transition and size and shape differentials and what some factors that can go into causing breakage. This is based on a viewer comment that I was trying to answer, and it, it's not, I'm not going to talk about that specifically, but it just got me thinking about the problem, and this would make a good video and explain these factors and give some suggestions to how to make uh, both manufactured new axes better when the handles come off the lathe all the way back to the user who should really count on having to do a little bit of work on the handle unless you're buying some really high budget axe. And even then, chances are you're probably going to want to do a little bit of modification to the handle. Okay, my viewer's problem was that he broke two handles in a row. The first one broke immediately, the second one that he put on and spent a bunch of time broke shortly after that. He said one of them definitely sheared just right across like this and another one, he thought the other one was similar but he wasn't sure. So I wanted to describe to him some of the factors that go into that and some of the possible solutions and that led to, that was the genesis of this video. Okay, so here's the problem and this is an inherent problem. We can only solve it so much. So we're just like making it the best we can to deal with something that will never be ideal or never be perfect. Okay, so we have a heavy mass on top of a relatively weak material. You know, there are other reasons that we use wood but inherently it's a fairly weak material like for instance fiberglass would be much more durable the difference in the mass between this material and this material you know this is like concentrated in a small ball of, of heaviness here and then this is relatively light is an inherent problem another common problem is that this straight line here forms a kind of a sharp edge like if i wanted to to break this handle by bending it and I was going to push it against an edge. If I push it against a straight sharp edge it's more it's more likely to break right. Now uh, commonly when an axe breaks this way or this way it's from side impact so if you're cutting into a notch when you're bucking or felling and you slam the axe head into the side of the cut like say this is a sloping cut inside the the tree that you're cutting down and you slam this well suddenly this heavy mass changes direction really quickly and for whatever reasons that I don't understand, this doesn't keep up and that causes you know, this to fail. Now that's gonna be important when we come back to it. That also can happen in limbing. So if you're trying to cut your limbs close to the trunk, which you should, and you, you swing for the bleachers, you slam the ax head against the trunk, then that can cause the same problem of suddenly jumping this mass in a different direction. And since this mass has a lot of embodied energy, it's carrying a lot of energy, that's what does the work, that's why it cuts. When that changes direction it can wreak havoc here. Now sometimes that split will just be like it'll kind of split off the side a little bit and form a crack that's like a slab and other times it will just shear right off. Another one is prying with the axe so let's say you you're splitting something and you get the axe stuck and you know that if you just you know you can use this handle and pry that thing open and pop it open like a lever you do that and you hear that sickening crack and it's all over. I would never say don't do that because I do it. It's just a matter of learning the limitations of the handle and that's usually going to involve hearing that sickening crack more than once when your handle fails. Okay, so there's a problem. Now I had a conversation with Rooster in the comments, Craig Roost from Axe Junkies. Shout out to Craig Roost, you're awesome. And he was saying that the, the ears on some axes like this serve not only to increase the um, the surface area and the contact with the handle, which is a good idea because the smaller, the more this is cut off and the smaller the surface area inside the eye, the more likely it is to come loose. But also that when you bend against this, it's less likely to shear than if you bend against a straight edge like this. Now that immediately made sense to me intuitively when he said that, but I still don't understand the mechanism of it entirely. But that's okay. I think he's right. Okay, so now let's get into this stuff down here, because how this is shaped, these transitions, the differential in thickness, the difference in shape of the wood in this area in particular, and going down to the rest of the handle, has everything to do with how much stress ends up being applied at this weak point. Okay, look at this caricature of an axe handle and head. So this is the back of the head. Now look at that, and imagine using this axe. Imagine this is a baseball bat. I think that's the best analogy because everyone's familiar with a baseball bat. Like there's a problem here. What's the problem? The problem is the differential between the size of this where it comes into the eye. And of course, you know, inside the eye, it's only, it's only this big. 
And so right here, this is a weak point, right? Because it's the thinnest point. It's the thinnest, weakest point of the ax is this, this here when stress is applied like that. Now the differential here makes all of the difference, ha ha. Stress is applied to this system. Let's say we have you know, a line through here and stress is applied across this line, then what's gonna give, right? The ax head's not gonna break. This is incredibly thick. It's not even gonna flex. This is important, it's not gonna flex. This is gonna flex and then it's gonna break. Why? Because it's only flexing right here. This is like barely flexing at all. It's almost insignificant. If we start to take this and reduce it, every bit we can reduce this differential. In my view, this is all theoretical, but you know I feel pretty strongly about most of it. Now, how's that? We still have essentially the same problem. We've just improved it a little bit. You know, we have um, the mass of this is also a problem, but it's, it has more, I think, to do with the flexibility. So now this is slightly more flexible but there's still a huge differential between these two. It's about 50%. So they say this is twice as wide as this is, and that's too much. Also, we have our handle sticking way out here, which is retarded, right? You don't want these shoulders sticking out a quarter inch each or even an eighth inch each. Let's, let's do this. Okay, we're gonna thin this down. And we're gonna say, okay, now it's approximately the same thickness right here as the ax head width, right? We have this width right here. And we're gonna make this part of the handle, the shoulder, the same. Now we do want this thicker than the eye because when the ax head comes down, it needs to seat against something. So this needs to be a little bit thicker, but we don't want it, in my opinion, we don't want it thicker than the head. And we're gonna come down a little like most ax handles do, although some don't come down very much. I don't know my own strength, I keep breaking the chalk. Much better. Now this is going to flex more. What happens? We apply a stress here, we apply a stress across this direction, and in any way, instead of just bending here, some of the stress is gonna be shared out in bending this. Now how far you take this and make it flex more to share more of this stress is another question. My theory is that the more that this flexes, the more stress it takes off of this point right here. Okay, so here's another problem, transition. Now we have a, we've, we've reduced this and we've improved it. I mean, I would thin this down a lot more, but we'll talk about that maybe in a minute or maybe not. But this transition is abrupt and sharp. You know, we have a pretty sharp angle right here and then it jumps over here quickly. And what does that create? That creates grain run out. So we've cut across this grain like this. Okay, now the sharper this transition is here, the more likely this is to break and we can make it more gradual. That's a benefit. This is a very common breakage point right here. Why? Because we're violating the grain like this and we've got a situation where this is more flexible. This is less flexible because it's fatter, so it's stiffer and it's gonna move less. And we apply stress, say, like this, and this just separates basically like that. Now this is even worse. If you see this where instead of coming straight out of the eye like that, this makes a shudden, sudden transition out here, say like an eighth or a quarter of an inch, uh, try to get rid of that. Let's say we have that. Now what's gonna happen when you hit your ax on a piece of wood here? You can think of it as stress coming back this way, pushing on this ax head. So suddenly your heavy ax head stops. The handle's going to flex this way, and this can pop open right here along the line, just unzip. So get rid of that. I mean, to me, the ideal ax handle comes straight out of the eye. This is the eye, and it goes in a straight line and does what it does from there. If it doesn't, this should be a very gradual, you know, and, and not too sudden transition to a belly like that if you want the handle to come in like this. Okay, so for whatever reasons, making these transitions more smooth is beneficial. So I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna look at it and I'm gonna say, why the hell did they have this come way out here like this? What purpose does that serve? Get rid of it. If this handle ever comes loose, 
you want to be able to tighten it. So you need a little bit of shoulder left here when you finish the ax, and you need a little bit here. You don't need very much. Like, let's say this could just come out like this much. We're going to make this transition a little bit smoother. So now we have something, hopefully, that comes relatively straight out of the chute here. Very little curvature here. Smooth transition, so there's nothing too sudden. And now we're talking. Sorry, this eraser doesn't work very good. But it's brain tanned buckskin, okay? So the cool factor on this eraser is extremely high. You know, to me, I like thin handles. Like I have something, this is a great handle here. This is a West Woods handle. I don't think I thinned this or scraped it very much. I think I just worked on this transition here because like all manufactured axe handles out of the box, it needs work in this area. Well, this is a great example of what I was talking about. So let's take a look at this. So as he suggested, and I totally agree, uh, take as little off the front here as possible. Just leave that in a nice straight line. It might curve down slightly. I'm not sure, but I can't, I can't tell from here. No matter, it's smooth. It's even. Now back here, this barely is any wider than the eye itself. It's just a little bit. So I can jump this down in the future. If it comes loose, I can fix it. That's cool. Not too much. And this slope is relatively even here. It's also thin this way. So we've changed the differentials between the masses, the mass of this zone right here, which is inherently weak, and this mass has been reduced. The difference in shape, the drastic differences in shape have been reduced, and the differences in flexibility have been reduced. So while this was you know, much more flexible than this, now this bulky area, which is inherently inflexible and inherently a problem, is now less different. It's left thus different in flexibility. Then it comes down into this nice thin handle here. When I use this ax, even swinging it, the mass of the ax is gonna cause a lag and this handle's gonna flex and when it hits stuff, the handle can take more stress. Like this is all moving, even this is moving, and that puts less stress on this part of the eye. Isn't that cool? With that understanding, we can go a long way. Now let's look at the same thing from the other side. Um, there was still much more thickness this way than I want, so I did the same thing. I want this to come down until it hits a, an area that's just a little bit thicker than the, uh, the eye width. So it's gonna stop, it's gonna nest here. This is super important to have a really tight nest right here at the bottom of the eye against, and, and that requires that you have somewhat of a shoulder. Also, I have enough room both in this direction with this thickness and this width right here left that I can jump this on probably three eighths of an inch more if I have to in the future, like say if this handle gets shrunk or for whoever owns it, you know, after me which will be one of you because we're going to give this axe away. When I'm done with a handle, uh, chances are that the eye width and this width are not going to be that different. Um, you know, maybe depending on the axe, but they're more close to equivalent. You could even argue maybe now that this area is stronger because it's wider and it has more strength in this direction, but it still probably has a little bit less strength in this direction than here and also because again you have this transition here with this sharp edge and this heavy mass like seated right here for instance if i were to bury this in a log and then i took the end of the handle and i pushed on it and pushed on it until it broke chances are it's going to crack here first and that says a lot okay now with this handle i didn't have to do that much i definitely did some work up here i took quite a bit off here i took quite a bit off here I took a lot right in this area because this came out much further than I wanted and then dropped down. None of that's a problem and none of it was a ton of work. But I didn't, I don't think I thinned this down at all. If I did, it's not very much. Whatever I had to do to this handle was not that much because this handle comes close to what it should be in the first place. Like pretty much any new axe handle, unless it's a company that's really doing a bunch of finish work for you you're going to have these kind of rough cuts and transitions. Now this is a council tool axe and they actually do quite well with this too. Again, I don't like this excessive thickness here. That's going to come down. This I want a little bit thinner, so that's going to come down. But I'm going to change, maybe you can see this better here. I'm going to change this differential and thickness between here and here. I'm going to smooth these transitions, but really they're not that bad. They're pretty good in this axe here. But you should still do that when you get a new axe. Start to smooth all that stuff off. 
a great tool to do that with, I don't have it with me, is uh, Shoemaker's Rasp. Okay, so let's look at this handle from House Handle. And aside from being incredibly crooked, it has this, you know, gross transition here of thickness where this is hugely fat, much, much larger than this. Like any full-size axe, like American axe that you would put on this, which is what it's made for, this is going to come stick way out, you know, thicker than the head itself. This is exactly the problem I'm talking about. The transition is not that smooth. Unlike, say, on the council axes, you can see that this slope comes down and it's actually milled all the way down to this point here. Whereas this one, you're going to mount about to this point here, and then that transition is only um, maybe a half inch or less long. My complaint with manufacturers is not that, you know, everyone, no one should have to do any work to their axe handle. That's, that's totally fine. It's expected. You should do that. It's like personalizing the thing and tuning it up and getting it ready for your, your particular use. What I'm saying is that drastic mistakes like this are costing breakage in handles. They're leading to breakage. People don't, they buy an axe at the hardware store. Even if they're looking at stuff on the internet, you know, they, and trying to educate themselves, they might not understand these things, and this is leading to breakage. Probably the worst example I remember seeing is Snow and Neely, which the handle was even thicker than this handle, which has almost no flex to it. That's significant, you know, when you're using the tool. It just, you know, it came way up near the shoulder and then suddenly it dove in, just like I had drawn this earlier. You have the super thick handle and it just suddenly dives out like this and then it comes down and it stays almost as thick the whole way down. Where this doesn't flex, it has a sudden transition. Don't do that. Okay, I hope that gives you an idea of what to do with that tool. I'm gonna go get a shoemaker's rasp so I can show you. Okay, here it is, the shoemaker's rasp. Shoe rasp, four-way rasp, uh, four-in-one, whatever you wanna call it. These are infinitely useful for shaping wood, bone, antler, you know, stuff like that that's not too hard. I would not use them personally on metal. I definitely wouldn't use them on steel because you're going to wear out the file part and it won't be as useful for your wood working needs. These are great for shaping these transitions, making handles, thinning handles. Unfortunately, I can't recommend a good one. I've been on Amazon looking at them and short of basically spending I don't know, probably a couple hundred bucks ordering everyone on there and doing a comparison, which I would love to do and I hope we'll do in the future. Uh, I just can't recommend one. I like this size here. If you're going to do portable, you could get the next size down. I think this is an eight, uh, so it would probably be a six inch.